never stop, no matter how many failures. When you know you're doing what you're meant to do, you have to try. Ted Lasso Season 3 Episode 6 is one I think people will either adore for the chance to step away and have a more isolated, single location character episode, or they'll hate it for slowing down the plot and, to be honest, probably not doing enough with the characters. You know, Roy and Jamie continue to be forming a close relationship, but besides a few hints, we still haven't explored his feelings around Keeley, nor have these training sessions actually affected anything. And even Rebecca, I do think her encounter with this unnamed man Man is meaningful, but we don't exactly know what it means for her, what impact this encounter will have. Perhaps until we get the next episode to tie it together more, it does feel slightly inconsequential. But I can fully understand why people would make that argument and why people wouldn't like this episode. However, I still enjoyed this. For me, this episode was about two things, freedom and beauty. Which is putting it loosely, I think they both amount to more than that. Um, you'll see what I mean, let's start with freedom. The fact is, we're at a point in the story where a lot of these characters are feeling stuck. Richmond aren't doing well, and they've lost their star player, their whole tactics were built around. Ted feels stuck, caught between the desire to return home, feeling he's abandoned his son, but also the sense he has something to do still at Richmond. He needs space to find inspiration and find a way forward. Like, I need to do something to help me get me out of my head. Psychologically, I think we're in a place where a lot of these characters can be summed up perfectly by the metaphor of the team wanting to go out and do something but not knowing what they want to do, becoming paralysed as a result. I think we've seen that with Rebecca. For most of this show, her drive was focused on Rupert, first destroying his old team in revenge against him, then trying to do very well with that old team, to be a better club owner than he was, and then to beat West Ham, also in revenge against him. The problem being that in those examples, her main purpose in life is still defined by Rupert, rather than truly finding what she wants for herself from life. And I think the chance to step away from all of that in a different country with a man who has no idea who she is, never even learns her name. I think that signals a chance to start exploring her identity away from being Rupert's scorned ex or the inheritor of his old club. Who else is she? Or maybe who else does she want to be? This unnamed man even delivers a good point along those lines, talking about how his own ex was unfaithful to him. It wrecked me and I came dangerously close to destroying our family on it. What time I realised that this thing didn't happen to me, it happened for me. The idea of him not knowing who she is being a good thing, that's kind of funny because it's the reverse for Colin, who asks the barman, Do you know who I am? I'm gonna tell you a secret. Tonight, you're wherever you want to be. And I mean, yeah, that's a relief for him, but we also know freedom for Colin would mean the freedom to be himself rather than anyone else, to be known for who he is rather than living two isolated lives. I love Trent's discussion with him here because Trent tells him his own positive story about coming out, but at no point advises or presses Colin to do the same because A, it's about how Colin feels, when and if he's ready, and B, their situations are massively different. It was really difficult to hold on to that secret. But I'm not a professional athlete. How do you do it? Is the perfect question. How the hell does he cope? You know, he's still in reality. Not a single Premier League footballer has come out as gay. I cannot imagine how daunting it must be for whoever is the first. Right now, all Trent needs to do is try to understand Colin's experience. An ache for both my lives to be my only life is for when we win a match to be able to kiss my feather the same way that guys get to kiss their girls. Colin even says he doesn't want to be a spokesperson and to be honest, coming out would probably turn him into one. Where no other Premier League footballer has done it yet, the freedom to be himself would come alongside a massive responsibility there. And again, it all leaves him feeling stuck. 
The last episode was about finding belief in yourself and others and believing you can move forwards. This one is about where to where to actually go, what to actually do, I suppose, finding the inspiration needed. Or at least that's what it felt like to me. Not everyone does find their answers here. Perhaps that's why this episode can feel slightly inconsequential. Or perhaps I've missed the point and someone can help out in the comments. Um, there is one person who does find their answer though, and there is something doubly meaningful in it. In fact, this is the thing that made me really enjoy this episode. So I'm going to talk about that, but first, um, you know what helps when I'm stuck? Uh, how does this one look? Why'd you bring me this one? It's the best one. Yes, World Anvil are still sponsoring me. This is a company I genuinely love. I'm going to keep promoting and supporting them as long as I physically can. <laughs> and all of you are going to listen intently. Um, World Anvil is an online tool for world building, character creation, story planning and writing, campaign building and playing lots of different games. A load of useful stuff. I use it for my novel with the sprawling mess all of my world building turned into and even just like I was keen on my fictional town having a strong sense of community so there was pages after page of who lives where, what do they think of their neighbours, where do they work, what are their opinions on local gossip, I don't know, a very big sprawling mess that World Anvil can really help to organise with hyperlinks, different categories, timelines, you can even completely build out of your own designed calendars. Again with hyperlinks attached to other articles and a map to link the different timeline events too if you fancy that. When there is so much detail it is hard to remember it all and having something like this to just quickly glance at and see what happens where and when becomes so damn handy. And there are other tools as well, I've not used all of them yet myself but all the ones I have used are pretty straightforward. They do have lots of tutorials for how to use everything but I've never needed to watch them, I've just figured it out myself pretty easily. There is a link in the description and as a pinned comment there is the code TREE which entitles you to 40% off any of their yearly subscriptions and if you want to try it out first they have a free version test that out for as long as you like first, get familiar with World Anvil, you know, if you're interested click the link. World Anvil. Now, um, what was I talking about before? He was just a humble preacher's son. And yes, he had his demons, but they never stopped him from searching for beauty. I think most of us now imagine that Ted is going to go back home to Kansas at the end of the season. He needs to be with his son. Struggling at Richmond, he seems to be thinking of home more than ever. Even looking at this painting makes him think of it. Kansas, a home. This here, this is our state flower. He wants to eat at an American food place despite its low reviews because it reminds him of home, and yet he is still here without really knowing why. He began the series wondering as much, and oddly, instead of making him more eager to return, these signs of home, they actually reinvigorate him for what he's doing. He still wants to try. When you know you're doing what you're meant to do, you have to try. Yeah, Dad, but you gotta try, right? I can't help thinking some of that might be because of his dad. You know, he quit on his family. He quit on himself. And I hated him for that. Ted is still here to try and win the league, to try and make his son proud. Even if that comes paradoxically along being away from him, he's here to honour his commitments, but also probably because he doesn't want to feel like a quitter. Ted felt like his dad was, that's how his death felt to him. Leaving now would feel like giving in, and so I think in relation to that, in relation to his dad, how this football season will end is going to be big for him. Van Gogh, or Van Gogh if that's how you pronounce it, is perhaps the iconic example of someone tormented by pain, working tirelessly to channel it into something beautiful. And I think in the pits of a failing team, divorced from his wife and miles from his son, we're meant to make a link between him and Ted here. Perhaps the point about creating something beautiful is important, it's what Ted tried to do with Richmond, but also this is an episode I think that celebrates the beauty of football like a piece of art. It's crazy to think that a game with a ball and two goals can elicit such intricate and, yeah, beautiful philosophies. Using movements to create patterns in shape, filling space with compositions the way a painting would, only it's ever-changing and evolving on a football pitch. Also combined with philosophies about mentality and physicality, uh, the 
rigid order of one team or the desire to dominate the ball set against tactics that champion chaos or fluidity. I don't know, thinking of home though reconnects Ted to his strengths, to what he knows of basketball from watching it with his dad. He cracks open this Van Gogh notepad and scribbles away like an artist with an array of paints before him, um, <laughs> primarily red and yellow paints. And it's satisfying because Ted has never done much tactical stuff in this show before. He's mainly stuck to the man management side of things and left the tactics to others. So it's nice to see him inspired to go further there, to use his tactical brain to invent... Total football. Okay, so nothing new. Um, also, I think in football they tend to make more diamond shapes instead of triangles, but um, the main point is the important one. Freedom for players to move about on the pitch. The way I see it, we've been playing too rigid, you know? Our guys need freedom. Rather than each player having a specific position to stick to, Total Football was all about space. Each player can move anywhere. The striker might drop back into defence, or a defender might suddenly spring up in attack. All sorts of crazy moves that can confuse the opposition, provided your other players fill the gaps that you leave behind. So, if a defender moves out onto the wing, maybe a winger will then move back to cover the gap you've left behind. It's free, it's fluid, and it relies on the team's understanding what each other player will do which I think adds to the idea of this team now needing to find belief in themselves and in each other again to be unified with each other now that they don't have Zava. Before they were very rigid and left all the creative flair to him but now Zava is gone. Realistically I think it's crazy to implement a system as intense as this when it might require a lot of understanding halfway through a season when you are the underdogs as well but artistically I think it's perfect. The inspiration of beauty helps them find their freedom again. I feel like that's the loose metaphorical idea running through here. I don't think it lines up perfectly, which either means I'm not quite hitting the nail on the head here, or this episode just isn't as tightly written as some of the others. It could be both, I don't know. Um, I feel like Higgins and Will's story here is nice, but it lacks much of a punch, you know, what does it change for either character? All the same, this is an episode that celebrates the art of football, and I think I'm always going to, despite despite how pretentious waffle this might sound, enjoy something that celebrates the beauty of sport. It's insane how something as inconsequential as a made up game can create so much meaning in our lives. You know, none of it is ever lasting, sports is all about passion for the moment, being with your teammates or your club or the other fans in the crowd, through all of the joys or failures of each game. Nothing brings a community together quite like sport does, and the fact that so much meaning can come out of something so small, I think it's testament to the idea that we can create meaning collectively. It isn't always something external you find, it's something you can build together, and I, I just, I really like that. Sport in itself is a perfect metaphor for all of what makes life meaningful in that way, so yeah, that's the conclusion here. <laughs> um, let me know your thoughts, like the video if you liked it, please tell me whatever it is I'm not quite hitting on the head, I feel like I've missed something with this episode. Subscribe if you want to watch more, my other videos I think are more clearer on Ted Lasso, um, so you can watch them. Thank you to World Anvil. Support me on Patreon if you fancy that, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Luke Kaur, Treat True Caber, Michael Gallagher, In Squares, Flying Spider, Arwin, Devin, Soup in Boots, Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Follier and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.